You may be seated. On behalf of Kate and John and Sharla and Alan and Chuck, Kalina and Aaron and the whole family, they, they want to let you know how much they, they love the way that you have poured out to them, how gracious, how kind you have been. The love over this last week has just been incredible and they want to thank you. They want to thank you for being here. It's been an incredibly difficult week as you can imagine. And your prayers have meant so much to them. And the outpouring of your love, just look at the, the stage. They're so thankful, they're so grateful. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we uh, just ask for your presence here. Lord, I, I pray that you pour out your Spirit to us. There is no words. Lord, I pray that through this time that our eyes are fixed upon you, our thoughts are upon you, our hope is in you. Lord, I pray your love just to pour down, to speak to us today, to reassure us, to comfort us. We thank you so much for Prince Life. We thank you for the outpouring of uh, love through the years. And Lord, I pray this, morning, this afternoon that you, you give us uh, the wisdom to speak to the glory of who you are and to remember Prince and remember him well. I, I pray all this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We pray this, today, we prayed several times coming into this afternoon that we'll honor Prince's life well, remember him well. And, and lift up the Lord Jesus Christ above all. And uh, Pastor Paul is going to share the obituary. And Pastor Paul actually was the pastor who, who wrote out their wedding vows, if I remember correctly. And uh, has a few other thoughts as well to share. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> Print Richard Zutavern was born on January 5th, 1992, to John and Sharla Kalina Zutavern in Broken Bow, Nebraska. He went to be with the Lord on February 24, 2020, at the age of 28 in North Platte. He was an especially happy child, adventurous, very creative, and wore a constant smile. Declaring preschool too boring, he dropped out and enjoyed accompanying his dad on ranch work. Print attended Sand Hills Elementary School until his family moved to Broken Bow in 2001, where he entered fourth grade. Initially, that transition was difficult for him, but he soon made lifelong friends, and his keen interest in shooting sports began. During his high school years, he kept busy competing in shooting sports, taking a particular liking to sporting clays. <laughs> Graduating from Broken Bow High School a semester early, he enrolled in Lindenwood University in St. Charles, Missouri on a shooting scholarship. He shot two seasons with that team before transferring to Fort Hay State in Kansas. Print was an NRA Collegiate All-American, a four-time National Sporting Clays Association All-American, and won two Collegiate Team National Championships. After his faith and family, ranching in the Sand Hills was Print's ultimate passion. In 2013, he left college to ranch full-time with his dad. Print had a strong commitment to his family's ranching heritage and loved raising cattle and caring for the land. <clears throat> Always looking for, for ways to innovate and improve, Print helped with the ranch evolve and expand, even fulfilling his dream of raising a herd of many Highlander cattle, which he sold across the country. Since his diagnosis of bipolar 1 at the age of 21, Print strived to manage his mental illness with his family's love and support. He fearlessly shared his experiences and struggles with that disease with those closest to him. Prince's faith and trust in the Lord Jesus also matured during that time. In the spring of 2015, he met the love of his life, Kate Johnson. and They were married on December 29th of that year. The couple had two children, Oakley and John, and were dedicated to raising their family to following the teachings of Jesus. Prince is survived by his wife, Katie Elizabeth, their children, Oakley Jane and John Moses, parents John and Charlotte, Charlotte Zutavern, sister Kalina Zutavern Baird, 
her husband Aaron, and their daughters Etta and Alma, and grandparents Marcena Zudavern and Larry and Glenda Felina. He is preceded in death by his grandfather, Richard Zudavern. French's sense of humor and extraordinary love of life was admired by many. He is missed by his family and friends near and far, and his contagious smile will never be forgotten. <clears throat> Psalm 61, verses 1 through 4. Hear my cry, O God, and listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever, and let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Well, as Pastor Tim said, I had a part in a small part to play in, in Kate and Prince's life when they decided that they were going to be married. So I really met Prince about five years ago. And Prince had asked Kate to marry him. And even though they were doing a destination wedding, they asked if I would do some premarital counseling. And of course, I said yes. And I remember our meetings together, but I especially remember our first meeting together. I was looking forward to meeting a guy named Prince. I remember clarifying that with Kate on a couple occasion. I wasn't sure if it was Prince or Print, but it was Print. And I love the story behind the name. Upon meeting Print, though, it became clear to me that he and Kate were going to be a good fit, and their a premarital assessment definitely confirmed that. I've married a lot of couples over the years. Most of them have been enjoyable experiences, uh, but some of them have been truly special and memorable. And my time with Print and Kate was very much in that category. Here's what stood out to me about Print. The time we shared together, first of all, Print was genuine and authentic, and you all know that. The moment he walked into my office and we sat down, I immediately felt totally comfortable with this guy. Sometimes when future grooms come to meet the pastor, they try to step up their game. Don't do that. And they present themselves in a little bit better light. <laughs> but print was print. And I immediately fell at ease with him and found him to be a joy to listen to. He didn't pull any punches. He presented himself as he was at that time in his life. His authenticity is what so many have loved or loved about him. His nine-year-old nephew, Drake, shared a letter about his uncle print. And I want to read this to you. I thought this was pretty neat. He writes, Print was a good man, if you ask me, a good uncle. I will hang on to all the memories I had with him in the short time I knew him. When it happened, Kate Oakley and John were heartbroken. John especially, he only knew his dad for about two years. He was my favorite uncle. No offense, Uncle Aaron. <laughs> we will have to tell stories about him, so Oakley and John don't forget their awesome dad. It was horrible to lose him. I love to go hunting with him. We loved him and he loved us. At least we know he is in heaven. He was a great man and we won't forget it. We miss you, Print. Love, Drake. Well said, Drake. I think the second thing that stood out to me about Print was that Print was very honest about his struggles. I remember talking in that first meeting about coping with mental health as well as overcoming addiction. And I remember thinking, I remember this very clearly, I remember thinking this has got to be one of the most honest conversations I've ever had with an individual in my life, especially someone that I had literally just met. He understood how crucial it was to not minimize this. He was well informed with how to treat this and how important it would be at times to get help. We talked about the type of help and support he would need from Kate and that this would be a different dimension in their relationship and in the marriage. And I so appreciated his honesty about his struggles. But I think what stood out to me most in that meeting and the times that we shared beyond that was the fact that Print understood and believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible's clear that we should not be unequally yoked. And unfortunately, I have too many people who come and ask if they can be married, and I know where they are with Jesus, but I'm not always sure where their soon-to-be spouse is. And I was a little bit nervous, to be honest with you, and I wasn't exactly sure, because I know Kate, I know her heart. 
But when he came in and I asked Print to describe his spiritual journey, I just loved listening to what he had to say. He talked about the gospel in the way the gospel should be talked about, not coming in our perfection because we're all a mess. Not coming with the sense of self-righteousness, but just coming in our brokenness and our sin. And, and the way that he understood that and the way that he said that, shared that and even acknowledged that where he was in that moment wasn't where he wanted to be, I, I just, I mean, I wanted to hug the guy. I was excited for Kate. He understood, like all of us here today, that he was in need of a Savior because of our sin. At a point in his life, the Holy Spirit made Print aware of this need, and he said yes to Jesus Christ. As I think back on those moments we shared together, I had no idea that we would find ourselves here today. In this place, celebrating and remembering his life. And Kate, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know this isn't what you envision either. And I know the events of the past week, as they spilled into Monday night, without a doubt are going to be the hardest moments of your life. And so I want to leave you with this thought. You probably don't remember this, but when you and Print got married, um, I helped Brian, who officiated your ceremony. I got the raw end of that deal. He got to go to Florida, and I had to write the ceremony. So I asked him what experience he had, and he, he was pretty honest about it. And I said, let, let me just write this, and you can do what you want. But one of the things that I did is I asked him, I said, would you please share some thoughts? I want you to read these to Kate and to Brent. And like most of the couples I marry, um, I don't ever expect them to remember what I said. But I always have the transcript. And so I went back, and I looked at that this week. And I shared with you guys through Brian, three I am statements that are designed to help you both keep a biblical perspective of marriage so that you could freely enjoy marriage as God intended you to. I want to remind you of the third statement. The third statement said this, I am committed to not expecting more than any person can possibly give. I've used that before, but Kate, you lived that. Thank you for loving print to the best of your ability. Thank you for understanding his struggle and trying to provide the type of love and help he needed. You loved him well, and you honored him in that. As you walk through the next days, weeks, and months to come, my prayer for you is best expressed in the words of the psalmist in Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2, where he writes, I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, where I will never be shaken. Amen. Thank you, Paul. This time, Kate would like to share with you you want to come on up now, Kate? And I love this lady's courage and some very important things that she wants to share on this day. First off, I would like to sincerely thank each and every one of you for the outpouring of prayer and support you have given our family within the last weeks and the weeks and months yet to come. I assure you that every message has been read and every prayer has been felt. There have been several moments this week where I have felt overcome with peace, and I know it's because of your prayer and the everlasting comfort from our God. We are so incredibly grateful for each of you and we will never be able to express just how thankful we are for your prayers. Brent was a great man, brother and son, and most importantly to us, an amazing husband and daddy. He had an infectious personality, which always made him the life of the party and made life incredibly fun. He had the ability to make friends with anyone in a matter of seconds, thanks to his huge smile and contagious laugh. 
He was the most creative, laid-back person I have ever known and taught me how to be spontaneous. He never had a worry in the world and was always showing me to look and find the bright side of everything. Brent was a giver and would do absolutely anything for those he loved. He fiercely loved the kids and I with every ounce of his being, and I am forever grateful for every second we shared and every memory we made in our way too short amount of time we had together. Mental illness is heartbreaking, cruel, and so, so real. Prince's situation never should have happened and was extremely preventable. And because of that, I promise to fight for the rest of my life to end this stigma, educate people on it, and make sure that not one single other person ever gets turned away after willingly asking for help. My heart is completely shattered from losing my best friend, but even most more so for our precious kiddos who have to grow up without their beloved daddy. I promise to always tell them how proud their dad was of them and how much they loved him. I will always hold them close, knowing they are my gift from God and my little piece of print here on earth. Through all the heartache, pain, and anger we have all been feeling, I can't help but be at peace, knowing print is home in paradise with our Father. His chains are gone, his mind is set free, and he will never have to deal with those demons fighting him again. I have absolutely no doubt that he has already found the fastest, most tricked out k and in heaven and has raced it to the top of the tallest hill in the sand hills of heaven, not only to look down on us, but also his herd of many cows he has undoubtedly already started. <coughs> and even though I'm determined to always keep his memory and love alive, I am very much looking forward to the day that I am able to join him again in the presence of our Lord. Amen. Amen. So beautifully said. As I said earlier, I just amazed at the courage and the love of Christ in you, Kate. I've seen that so many times. For the family also, Kalina would like to share, and the family has asked if she could share a few thoughts. And I believe Brian is going to stand with her. Nana, I'm the brains and she's the muscle, declared my brother one day to our grandma Glenda. I was out of earshot when he said this, but he was referring to me and he was probably right. During much of our childhood, print was the brains and I the muscle, and I would venture to guess that quite a few of you here today can relate to that. Print probably talked you into working on projects or ventures that he had concocted, most of them pretty fun, I bet. Print was the idea man, an entrepreneur, and the one to get the ball rolling. He was constantly looking for ways to improve, and that included improving his own life. Print suffered from bipolar disorder, but he took charge of that too. His determination to control his disease was perhaps most evident when he went to a unique dual diagnosis treatment center in Malibu, California called The Canyon. Dual diagnosis means it treated both addicted behavior and mental illness at the same time. He had just come off of one of his first horrific manic episodes and agreed to stay in the treatment center for three whole months. Being in Malibu, you can imagine the kind of place this center was. It was pretty ritzy, designed for the rich and famous. It was also very intense, with all kinds of therapies, guided imagery, art therapy, equine therapy, which, if I remember right, he kind of laughed at, but they told him not to miss out on anything. So you name the therapy and they had it. He met with his counselor daily there and had group therapy twice a day. Mom, of course, kept in close contact with his counselor there, and sometimes she'd call the center asking for print. His counselor would often reply with something like, well, you can't talk to him right now. He's leading group meditation by the ocean. It wouldn't surprise you that print was very popular there. Here was this young redneck hick from the sandhills of Nebraska, 
among some of these wealthy and often very liberal businessmen or women from all kinds of backgrounds. But Print connected with all of them. Mom, Dad, and I went, witnessed this firsthand at a family weekend there. And I give you this glimpse into his time spent at the canyon because it illustrates three of Print's best qualities. His grit and determination, his ability to connect with anyone, and his genuineness. Was there anything Print couldn't do which, once he set his mind to it? Print missed shooting so much that last summer he got the idea to construct his own regulation-sized ski range right on the ranch. I don't know how much time passed from when he got the idea to when the range was complete, but I would bet it wasn't long. And this range was legit. The low house was an old grain bin, and the high house was constructed out of scrap tin and wood. It had remote poles, and it was measured out to the T. In June, Dad and my husband Aaron shot a few rounds of skeet on that range, and Print pulled. And I will never forget the smile on Print's face as he watched them and coached them. Do not look at that target, look at where the target is going to be, he'd say. He also had some other more discouraging and choice words to say about the guy shooting that day, which I won't repeat. But it was such a joy to see his face light up, and it's just a great memory. The point is, Print had a way of making his dreams into realities. And did Print ever meet anyone he couldn't talk to? I was so envious of his social abilities. He made striking up conversations with strang strangers look effortless, didn't he? Any age, background, or situation, he found a way to speak with people. And Dad remembers that at a Cleveland Browns game, Print started talking to an older gentleman sitting right next to them. And Dad guessed the man was in his 70s, and it wasn't long before he and Print were shooting the breeze, talking about Nebraska football and Johnny Rogers, and just watching the Browns game together. He was so good at including others and was a great host, and his authenticity made him relatable and made others feel comfortable around him. And did Print ever avoid talking about his experiences and struggles with his bipolar disorder? Those close to him knew all about it. He didn't shy away from the truth. He didn't hide or sugarcoat his struggles with addiction or his manic episodes. And his mental illness was a large part of what made Print Print. He was his own ambassador for mental health. Print loved life, and the way he lived it made you love it too. He could do anything he put his mind to, had the ability to make anyone feel like a friend, and was unapologetically himself. It is my prayer that his death is as meaningful as his life was. I know his passing has already made an impact on this world and will promote positive change. We need to acknowledge the amazing creation of people who suffer with bipolar disorder and mental illness. May Prince's life make us more aware, to share more, and to encourage those touched by mental illness. It is a true blessing to have had Print in our lives. He loved so many. He was an awesome father, and he adored you, Kate. Oakley and John. You guys shared the best years of his life. So, this is a, uh, anyway. Praising God, even in the midst of Prince death, can seem impossible, but it's not. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we need to praise the Lord in all circumstances, even in blinding anger and indescribable sorrow. So I'd like to praise the Lord with you now, for his eternal blessings and for the blessings that he gave us through print. Um, I'd like you to join me in singing the first and third verses of the well-known hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
So we have no doubt that Prince Zutavern is in the realms of endless day, and he's making the most of it. Dad and I were talking about this morning what Print might have said when he had his first come to Jesus meeting with Jesus himself. And we imagined he said something like, well, I know you're the best sheep herder around, but I don't see many cattle here, so let's start a mini herd. <laughs> so my little buddy, thank you for being you. Thank you for all the laughs, and I praise the Lord God Almighty that you are with him at Jesus' side. He has wiped your tears and made you whole and perfect. And oh, brother, when I see you again, I will enjoy watching you shoot some sporting clays, and I'll help you check the heifers. <laughs> and you can be the brains, and I'll be the muscle. Mm -hmm. Until then, keep smiling, that beautiful smile. We love you. Amen. So beautifully spoken. Print loved music. In fact, his grandma was just telling me that when they would get together at the holidays, he would say, speed it up, grandma, come on. Uh, let's get a little energy in this. And so uh, the families requested that we sing together and continue just in praise of, the, of our Heavenly Father who he's with today. And uh, they love this song, 10,000 Reasons. Would you please stand and join us as we sing together?
We know that Prit, as you've heard, shared already, that Prit is in the, the presence of, of God Almighty. And, and he's worshiping. And I, I love this passage, and I want to begin here. It's from John chapter 10. I know it's about sheep, but it's still so relevant. <laughs> my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish and no one, no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the, the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I, I'm so thankful for the Word. And, and this has been something the family has leaned back into is the Word. The truth of God's Word. The promises. They've hung on to them. And because these promises are good. I pray this afternoon that we honor Prince life well, but we also recognize the one he is with eternally. And no one will snatch him out of his hand. I don't know if I can say this right. I'm going to try it again. I said it earlier with the family. But when Prince was a little boy, about three years old, and I, I talked to some of you who took care of him about then, he, he couldn't say his R's or his L's. And, and he came home, and, and Charlotte was trying to figure out what he was saying. He said, Aster urds on the ord. Let me try it again, see if you can catch it. Aster urds on the Lord. It says, what he was trying to say was, cast your cares on the Lord. Can't you just see him saying that? I mean, can't you see that little three-year-old running around early in his life talking about God's Word? The family's asked around to speak today about his, at his memorial service at Psalm 55, specifically 22. But I wanted to add 18 as well. Verse 18, David wrote this psalm, and he said, He has redeemed my life in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many against me. And then the verse that he was repeating at three years old, it goes, cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Through this week, as I met with the family, I, I watched little John running around and he just had this picture. The family shared that when Print was seven years old, that he, and, and VBS, accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And I, I pray some of, I know many of you, are probably going to be involved with VBS. We don't take those things lightly. At seven years old, he asked Jesus to forgive him of his sins. You know, and David wrote this psalm that we just quoted from Psalm 55. And David, he actually wrote in Psalm 103, he says, forgives all my sins. That what happened when when Print asked the Lord to forgive him of his sins when he was seven years old, he asked him to forgive all of his current sins, all of his future sins, all of them were washed away. And I'm going to challenge us today, do you really believe that? You know, at seven years old, he accepted Christ. When he was about 10 or 11, he was baptized in the Loop River by Gates. And through these grade school years, I loved hearing the stories of how energized he was. I love that, that preschool story. He, he no opted out. I'm above that. I don't need that. And, it, it's, and many of his classmates talked about how brilliant, brilliant he was. How he had vision. But you know, the thing that I talked with his friends that said so much about him was his, his friends knew they loved him. And he loved them. Print was a great friend. 
And he knew how to be a friend, and he cherished those friendships so deeply. I, I remember when we were talking about dedication, I had a little bit of a different experience with Print because he was checking me out. You know, have you sat with Print? You know, he, he looked at me like the first time when it was, oh, this is my precious daughter Oakley we're going to dedicate here. And he looked at me, and I could say, uh, you know, we talked a little bit, and I said, okay, did I pass? And I got that big grin. Yeah, I passed. He loved his kids so much, and it was on this stage that he dedicated his children and confessed the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior and, said, and committed that he was going to raise them and raise them in the ways of the Lord. What every person said about Pritt was a brilliant, I love this part, was that how he had vision. Did you hear that and read that in his, his obituary? That always looking for ways to innovate and improve. Print had incredible vision. He could see ahead. And he didn't like waiting to get there either. <laughs> I can hear by your, yeah, we know, he wanted to go. In their home is this incredible picture and, of the picture of the calves, the minis, he was so proud of. He was so, and he worked so hard. He had that vision. I understand that picture is better than, than all the others. He was able to process information so rapidly, so incredibly, so gifted. But I love the fact that the family has asked that we be transparent about the battle. And, and, and Kate's heart about wanting us to understand. And I, I pray today that we don't take lightly what that means to all of us here. and What it means of how we love this family through this. Because it's going to challenge some of us in how we look at mental illness. That passage in Psalm 55, 18, He has redeemed my life in peace from the battle. In a little bit, we're going to sing, My Chains Are Gone, because this is, this is what we understand has happened. His chains, his battle, the bipolar is over. You remember hearing that since his diagnosis, a bipolar one at age 21, how hard he worked and how much this family has loved him through this. I, I pray that I was a blessing, but I always walked away a blessed from all of you. And as we pray that we come into this, and I would ask that we start here, that we stand in this love and this grace without judgment. And I, I ask that all of us, we hear this very carefully. Jesus said this very succinctly in Matthew 7, 1. He says, do not judge. For some of you may know this, but what he actually said was do not condemn. And the reason that Jesus said that is because None of us have the authority to condemn. Only Jesus does. And you know, it's easy to fall into that. And let me just say that this is a no crino zone. There is now no condemnation in Christ. And that we are going to approach this in grace. Now I pray that each of us, we stop and we prayerfully in our own hearts look at this and we come at this in the grace and see it through Jesus' eyes. Prince's battle was overwhelming at times, as we all well know from this last week. And, and I want to challenge us in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 2. He tells us this, so that your ear is attentive to skillful and godly wisdom. That means we take part in seeking to understand. And apply it to our heart to understand, seeking con conscientiously and striving to understand what's happened. I loved how Kate shared that today. But I would suspect that if, unless you actually have bipolar 1, you have a hard time understanding what's happened. And I'm going to ask you that we look at three things. First, I want you to consider something. I would ask you for a moment to consider that, that you're coming up on a 8% grade of a two-mile drop. And you're driving a very large truck. If any of you are like me, if you're in the mountains and there's an 8% grade, the only way I can get through it is Benadryl, man. Just put me in the passenger seat because I don't like them. But imagine that for a minute, that you're, you're in this truck and, it's, and you're loaded and, and you got an 8% fall and you think you have brakes at the beginning of this fall. 
But as you go down the hill, about halfway you find out there's no brakes. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? This was Prince Battle. This was Prince Battle. How do you stop? This family, this family knows this so well. And, and it's real easy as you realize and you think about that for a moment, how hard this must have been and how hard this is. The family and closest friends, as Kalina spoke of, know this and have seen this moment. The things we don't see is how many times Print was successful at getting this derailed or get back on track and how hard he worked at it. And I know that you saw the battle in Print if you know him. But if you don't seek to seek, understand Print's battle, you will be prone to believe that, oh, somehow the willpower could stop it. Second thing that I would ask you to consider and I, I want to challenge us what we actually believe about mental illness. I, I don't claim here to know the reasons I don't have them. But there are many in our culture who default into believing that the, the person can control this or somehow if they just tried harder. And I want to dispel that. I, I want you to consider one other story as you think about what bipolar really is. A few, a few years ago, my wife's dear grandfather dramatically changed. Merrill was this incredible guy. Uh, as a kid, he grew up in Oregon, Missouri. And uh, he, he used to, uh, I think he, he actually had some times that he probably ran some alcohol. I'm not sure. Merrill, he, he won, a, <laughs> he won a, and lost a gas station in a craps game, you know, if you want to hear the story. He met the love of his life. And he devoted his life to Christ. And, and when he was 84 years old, he helped me shingle my house. And the whole time we were shingling, he was repeating the whole book of Luke. I was, I was a, <laughs> in seminary at the time, and I was going, wow, he's getting this thing right. But what we didn't know was the battle that was within him in the early 80s. And how the dementia was coming upon him. That he cut a hole in, in the spare bedroom to spy on his, his wife. And then he started missing things. And then how angry he, he couldn't control it anymore. By the 90s, he was in full-blown dementia. And he held my wife against the counter. And she had to call for help. I want you to listen very carefully to something. I'm not comparing bipolar to dementia. But I, I want us to see something here. I am saying, would you ever say that Grandpa should have or had better power to stop it? Then why would we say that about bipolar? Never would I shame someone because they couldn't stop it or shame the family like somehow they didn't do enough or shame those that had to step in and to help. We would never speak, though, or never speak of like with Grandpa that the confession of Jesus was somehow less because he had this problem. And I pray we stand on the truth of God's Word and not fall into this judgment. And we don't have the answers to why. And we don't have the authority to judge. But we have the responsibility to seek Christ and see it through His eyes. I share this not to condemn any of us, but to understand the battle that Print had. And it was huge. It was real. It was real. I want to challenge us, one, lastly, about going forward to seek God's healing for ourselves and as we come alongside the family as well. You know, when tragedy strikes, it is common for people to ask, what does this mean? When we witness a tragedy, there is a natural feeling that, there, that this shouldn't have happened. This is an innate sense of wrongness. It is a clue to meaning of, in these, there's, some, there's, there's a meaning in these events. 
And when we look to find the meaning in tragedy, we must have the right perspective. We need to approach the question in a way that allows us to seek a coherent answer. And that is only possible through Jesus Christ. Because God instills meaning into every moment, every event in history. We have to understand the nature of this world and our relationship to God in order to draw meaning from all of this. God infuses every moment, every event with meaning and gives us confidence that He understands what we are going through. And we need to understand this, that Jesus instituted the communion, for example. He tied the past, present, and future together. He said, for as often as you eat the bread, drink the cup, that's the present. You proclaim the Lord's death, that's the past, until it comes, the future. God's knowledge of all events means everything is important that we understand it through His eyes. If God knows that when a sparrow falls, He certainly knows when we face tragedy like we're seeing this last week. And we also understand that He's experienced this with us because Jesus went through these things. While we understand that God has sovereignty, and sovereign control over all things, it is important to remember something, that God is not the source of tragedy. The vast majority of human suffering is caused by sin. The battle for us all facing and living is a broken world. Tragedy brings us to to three things. First, it brings us to seek God. And I pray you are. Second, it brings and develops our spiritual strength day by day, one minute at a time. And third, it increases our desires for heaven, as you heard Kate say earlier. I pray you listen very carefully. In the Garden of Eden, God spoke to Adam and communicated in clear, direct ways, not in abstract concepts. God speaks to us today in the same way. In some ways, this is important meaning to be found in any tragedy, and especially in this one. Tragic events demonstrate much of their meaning the way we react to them. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to arouse the deaf. And I would imagine that there are many here asking that question. Drawing you to seek God. Drawing you to go closer to Him. As Kalina spoke and shared in the song that that the fountain is, is that He is going to deliver us through this. Tragic events remind us not only that we live in an imperfect and fallen world, but there, there is a God who loves us and wants something better for us than the world has to offer. I I would draw your attention to this passage on the wall. That may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing through the experience of your faith. That by the power of the Holy Spirit you will abound in hope and overflow with confidence in His promises. Kate, your faith has been incredible. All of you, family, you've spoken to us as a community. You've blessed us. I want to ask you all something. Do you believe your doubts or do you believe and doubt your beliefs or do you believe the promises and doubt your doubts? Let me say that again. Do you you decide, do you believe your doubts? and doubt your beliefs, or do you believe the promises and doubt your doubts? When Print was seven years old, he asked Jesus to forgive his sins. When he was ten, he confessed publicly that he belonged to Jesus and that Jesus was his Lord. When he met Kate in premarital counseling with Pastor Paul, affirmed his faith in Jesus Christ. In August of 2018, at John's dedication and earlier in Oakley's, he confessed Jesus as Savior. 
The family's asked me to share bluntly and boldly the gospel. And it's very simple. And I would ask you, have you heard yourself say these words that Jesus is Lord? Have you heard yourself say, would you, Lord, forgive me of my sins? The family heard that from print, and they stand on those promises today, and this is what gets them through. This is what they sang about. This is the promises, and this is the hope, and this is the, the change that's going to come in changing how we look at mental illness. I, I, I ask you to think of this passage in Romans 10, 9 through 11, because if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, recognizing his power and authority, majesty as God, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes in Christ, resulting in his justification, that he's being made righteous, being freed from the guilt of sin and made acceptable to God in which print stands in right now. Have you heard yourself confess those things? Do you believe this? Or do you doubt? Setting up you to doubt your beliefs. Kate, you loved your husband so well. And John and Charla and Lena and Aaron, Chuck and Ellen. You know, for many in the family through the past months and years, and I, I said this to Kate and it was, she nodded yes. There were times that when you would ask Kate, most likely how was your day, she probably would answer, depending on the situation, I don't know, let me check with print, I want to know how he's doing. Not because there's something wrong with her because she sacrificially loved her husband. You know, this is what love looks like. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, 9-12, through 12, says two are better than one because they have more satis are, are more satisfied in return to their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and does not have another to lift him up. It was a beautiful thing how you loved him. All of you, how you reached out and you graciously loved them. It was a testimony to all of us in this community of how to love someone through mental illness. I praise God for that testimony. And I pray that as a community around them that loves them, wake up. I know that Prince's last days were tough. With all that happened from February 23rd to 24th, all the details they'll play over, I know. I know, I, I know that every one of us will have those memories, those thoughts. But I pray that we put our thoughts back into the hope of God to see us through. You know, I pray that we have a path in closing where there's a fork in the road that we have a path with all the things that have happened in this last week, we can either step into the forgiveness, and, and there may be many in this room who, who knows have different thoughts about these things, but to step forward in the hope of God means that we need to forgive. That we need to step into this truth and this love of God, forgiving whoever it may be to step into this. And I, this will be a challenge for each one of us. Kate asked that we sing this last song together as a congregation. She loves these words. It is that my chains are gone. And she said this many times that his chains are gone. He's no longer bound by bipolar. And so in a moment, I'd, I'd like for you to stand and we sing together this incredible song, My Chains Are Gone. i 
Father, we, we thank you for Prince Life. We thank you for his courage, how he lived. Lord, I, I thank you for his family, how they have loved him and how he loved them. Lord, we, we can't explain all that's happened, but we trust that you, in your ways, in your truth, in your love, will show us how to go forward. Lord, I pray your love and mercy will just rain down on this family. Again, we thank you for Prince Life. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for the promises that you have him with you and that no one will snatch him from your hand. And for those who love you, have committed their life to you, will see him again. Lord, I, I pray there, if there are any in this room who have heard the gospel in a way that you have spoken to them, that they will turn their lives and they will confess you as Lord and Savior. We love you, Lord, in Jesus I pray. Amen.
We're going to escort the family into the area over here. And in a, <clears throat> we're going to have them off to the uh, activities room where the dinner will be served. They would love for you to come join. Uh, but we'd ask if you could step out in the area, and maybe it's outside, but it's nice out in the afternoon. We need just a few minutes to get the tables ready. They would love to have you join them. It's a chicken, I mean, it's a beef dinner. <laughs> <laughs> you loved him well. It's so good.